Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Dennis Tyrell of Tyrell Knife Works. One of my great patrons recommended I check out Dennis's YouTube channel, and when I did, I was totally and immediately convinced and hooked. Dennis is a hobbyist knife maker forging beautiful and complex fixed blade knives, oftentimes while filming the process for those who are interested or inspired uh, to do the same. His gorgeous creations have won him knife making contests with his knife making peers and a devoted coterie of collectors. And how a mere hobbyist can hang with the professionals and make such dazzling works of useful art, we'll find out in just a minute. But first, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you know when new videos are uploaded. Download us wherever you listen to podcasts uh, so you don't have to uh, be tethered to this device. And then join us on Patreon where you can get all sorts of extra uh, knife content and perks, like a little bit of extra uh, interview, like from what we're going to have tonight. So be sure to check it out at the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? Then you're probably a knife junkie. Dennis, welcome to the show. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, like I mentioned, you're you're a new quantity to me, but man, uh, I'm like usual late to the game because uh, you have a huge following on YouTube uh people and and collectors collecting your knives watching you put these things together and um i think it's uh it's amazing uh the work you've been doing and the funny thing is reading your bio you mentioned forged and fire up front how did how did that inspire you yeah i consider myself kind of the part of the forged and fire generation i guess um used to watch the show with my son who's now 16 but whenever forged and fire started thought it would be something fun for him and I to do and you know knew nothing never worked with metal never did anything and uh you know bought a welder built a forge and it all started from there and then about a year later decided to document my own journey um because I learned everything on YouTube and I figured why don't I start a YouTube channel so that's kind of the kickoff of the whole thing uh, you mentioned the first thing you got was a welder. What? Uh, that's. I mean, I I see how they're used in Forged and Fire to weld uh, pieces together to make Damascus or to weld a billet to a piece of uh, uh, rebar. But why was that the first thing? Well, because I figured I wanted to know. I didn't know any metal work, so I wanted to learn how to build the tools to build the knives before I went to like, I, I wanted to learn how to blacksmith in order to do that. I wanted to learn how to make a forge. And I, so I really, I started from build the tools, then use the tools to build the, the stuff. And I, I still recommend people do that. Get a welder and learn how to weld. It is a critical, you know, you want to be a knife maker. You got to know how to weld. That's uh wow. That's pretty, so you're taking it to the, uh, that's very, like people say this a lot these days, but that's very meta of you. Like to, you're, you're not just making the knives and buying the equipment to make the knives. You're making the equipment to make the knives. Uh, how, so that sounds like a stalling tactic. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what was your, I mean, how, well, I'll tell you part of it was I didn't want to invest a lot of money. So uh, I figured I could make a forge for 50 bucks and it wouldn't cost me an arm and a leg. So if I decided I didn't want to stay in the hobby, I wasn't, totally invested so there's that part of it too all right well, what was that first forge like was it like a coffee can forge or something like that no i still have it it was made out of um um air compressor cylinder worked great still works great two burner forge uh did tons my the first year of my um my youtube channel was done on that forge hmm. like all the all, all my, a lot of my big builds were still done in that forge so okay, presumably you you took this on as a as a as a man who had already lived a portion of his life. You know, you're not, you you weren't a spring chicken when you took this on. Uh, I think you and I are 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 in similar generation. I think we're the same generation, close in age. And uh, so you took this on. Uh, you know, I, I I've talked to a lot of people. You know, who have been doing this their entire life, and and uh, and they make great work. You've been doing this for a short period of time. 
and you make great work. How, how do you account for <laughs> that? Um, I've always been pretty good with my hands. I've got, um, I, I like building stuff. Like I've, I've done Mason, like, I mean, hobby stuff, like masonry stuff. And I've done, you know, I do, I do a lot of cons little construction projects around the house. So it wasn't, it was just a new medium. It wasn't like I didn't know how to build things. Um, I've done a lot of woodworking okay. stuff. So it, it was more of a challenge for me. Like I work in the high tech world as my day job. So, um, I like to do things that are very hands-on and, you know, things I can make. So that, that intrigued me and, uh, just the whole concept of making a knife I thought was cool. So that's what got me into it. So I could see how, you know, you're using, you're in the high tech world during work and then you go, maybe you come home and, and fire up the forge. You start working on a knife. It's, it's accessing a different part of your brain. You're being creative, but it's a different, different type maybe. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I do a lot of, like, I work for a software company. I manage a bunch of software engineers, and it's all about UI. It's all about user interface. And really, you think about it, it's just a different user interface. Right, it's, right. Uh, you know, I, I work on pixels and graphics, so I'm used to designing things and software and YouTube, all that stuff comes naturally, like the editing part. Right, right. Okay, so you 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 get the welder, and then you start building your forge. And I know uh, what it said on your bio page, on your web page, you actually even even made a big, uh, um, uh, what do you call those big blue hammers, the big giant. Uh, <laughs> I did make a power hammer. A power hammer. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so so how did you uh, tell me what happened after, you, you know, you created these machines? Tell me about how you developed your skills. So, I mean, it's I think I started like a lot of people just made a couple of knives. I had cheap anvil hammer forge started that way made the kind of mistakes everybody makes on their first half dozen knives they look terrible you get you improved but one of the mantras that i always follow is that um there is always something new in every one of my knives there's always a new technique i'm every single build has something that i've never done before so that really and I recommend that to everybody. And some people say, oh, you should make the same knife over and over and over until you perfect it. I come at it from the other angle where I want to do a tool, totally new technique. It could be small, could be a new knife design, but it, it could be a pattern in Damascus. I always do something different every build. Um, whether it's learning engraving, doing a, you know, all kinds of stuff. So that really pushed me. And I think I've accelerated my learning by doing that. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I progressed and then making the tools and, and just being on YouTube and getting, you know, when I started, I, I, I wanted to try to sell my knives and I figured, well, if I get a YouTube channel, then maybe I'll get people that want to buy my knives. And it, it completely reversed where instead of YouTube driving knife sales, now my focus is entirely on YouTube and, um, you know, I make knives because YouTube drives me in because I have a weekly build schedule. And so that that pushes me as well. I did not get that. I did not understand that. I mean, well, I guess because I'm somewhat new to you, <clears throat> I knew that a lot of your work was featured in your videos, but I what I didn't understand quite the interplay between how the videos drive the production of the knives. Yeah, it's it's like the never ending hamster wheel of, oh, I, I got to get this weekend's video ready. And uh, and I have a video. I have two videos a week, one a Thursday, one Sunday. The Thursdays are the like the tips videos for knife makers and Sundays are the build videos. So I'm always I'm always trying to get new content and new. Um, um, sorry, that light just went off. Uh, I'm, I'm always trying to get new stuff for the um, for my Sunday builds. This, I mean, that's that's great. You know, I was talking about stalling tactics before. That's this is actually the opposite. This is I've noticed when I work with people like like my very highly valued producer Jim. When you work with someone, uh, and and in essence, you're working with your entire uh, crowd and the collectors out there. When you work with someone and you're committed to a schedule, you can't falter or everything fall everything goes. So you're kind of reliant on one another that's a those kind of partnerships are always good and in a sense your knife making is partnered with your video making and they you know 
kind of keeps you on the straight and narrow. Yeah, it, it definitely, and I like it because it drives me, like sometimes you just, oh, I don't want to go in the shop. I don't want, you know, but it's like, I got to get a video done. So right. it gets me in there and gets me doing things. So before you mentioned that each new build, each new knife, you want, you try something new and that's accelerated your learning. Um, do you think that that is part and parcel of working in the, in forging as opposed to, um, stock removal or, or designing and having things made? I mean, uh, do you think forging gives you flexibility in other words, to sort of really uh, do that? Oh, sure. Sure. Of course. Cause I knew, I knew from day one, my goal was getting into a lot of Damascus. So therefore I needed a press. I needed like, so forging was always going to be in the equation. Okay. Um, but even, even if I, and I still would encourage, if you're a stock removal maker, I would still encourage people like do hidden tang knives, do frame, frame designs, do, do other techniques other than just you know, the full tang knife with the knife scales. And, you know, I, I just, maybe I have a short attention span and that stuff just gets boring to me. I always want to do something new and Damascus patterns are endless to me. So that's, that's a big thing for me. This, uh, this video here was fascinating actually, because right here, um, so you're making a Bowie knife here and you're, you're shaping the tip. Uh, when this video starts, you're shaping the tip. Right now, you're hammering in the bevels, and you and you and you state that you want to start with sort of a spear point, and then as you hammer in those bevels, it will curve the knife up forward, and it will naturally give itself a clip. Right? Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, to me, uh, that was very exciting. This was an exciting video to watch. This is. Uh, tell us about the knife you're making in this video. Uh, this actually is, so I'm in the process of getting my ABS journeyman Smith rating. And, uh, for your viewers that might not be familiar with that, that's the American bladesmith society. When you first join your apprentice, everybody's an apprentice. And then after three years, you can apply and take the test to be a journeyman. Um, there's, there's two parts of that. There's a performance test, which you may have seen that video. Um, but then you have to, once you pass the performance test, you have to make five knives that get judged by a panel of master smiths. So what you're watching is, uh, is this knife, um, this Bowie. So this is one of the five knives that will get judged by um, master smiths in June at Blade. This oh, will be wow. one of my entries. At Blade Show. Yeah. So what are they looking for? Um, for the present, the five presentation knives, it's all about fit and finish. Okay. It's... It's not about them being fancy or having, you know, you, you save that for master smith. On journeyman, they're looking for fit and finish, symmetry, um, no gaps in the guard, um, you know, no sand, no J hooks in your sanding, like all the sanding, hand sanding has to go the same way. Um, very symmetrical knife. Uh, things are, you know, no scratches anywhere, that kind of thing. So it's all fit and finish. Okay, so they are they are inspecting it with, with um, with a magnifying glass. They are really yeah. really looking, <laughs> and then and then uh, so I saw at Blade Show this past year someone had their five uh, Master Smith test knives out, I believe, and one of them was this exquisite dagger. It was so ornate, I couldn't believe. And it's a brilliant dagger, it's yeah, a requirement. <laughs> yeah, and the and the gentleman was was telling me like uh, I was like, oh, I love the the way you braided the the you know the handle he's like oh no, you have to do that really yeah and then yeah. i love your quill oh no no you have to like everything on there that i thought was extra that he did for extra points it was all required it's amazing yeah the the for master smith you have to make your five knives they all have to be damascus and one of them what you have to make a quillian dagger that's the one requirement knife all the others you can make your own whatever you want so for, for people who might not know i mean i i think i know but why why would they require a quillian dagger it's just one of the most technical knives um i think i personally think it's one of the most beautiful knives um but it's very technical um a, a dagger in itself is just the symmetry has to be perfect you got four bevels mm -hmm. um just the guard uh the fit up the spiral fluted handle some of them have the wire inlay on them, pommel. It just has every aspect of complexity. Um, so that's why they want a master to 
to show how they can put one of those together. Okay, but for journeyman, now, what does journeyman mean? When you're a journeyman, that means you're in the club, but you have a long way to go until you're a, a head. I mean, like, describe um, what that means exactly. I would say it's it's the first actual rank in the ABS because everybody okay. joins as an apprentice, and there's only two ranks. So there's, you know, if there was, and I don't know the exact numbers, but if there's, you know, I'm making stuff. If there's 5,000 journeymen, mm -hmm. there's like... 200 masters okay so uh, there's a lot more journeyman journeyman like journeyman is a still a very high rating and journeyman you you command a much higher price for your knives once you put that js stamp on your knife because oh. you've been tested for quality okay okay so this is something this is not only a personal um oh well, i mean Obviously, I'm just I'm I'm thinking uh, I'm not I'm thinking naively. This is not just a personal accomplishment and and a way for you to take your art to to the highest level it can go. It is also a marketing thing in a, in a sense. You can, like you said, like yes, I, I get it. That makes sense. It's like any other certification. You want to go for someone that's got that certification if you want the best. Yeah, and you can be sure once once I or anyone gets their Journeyman Smith rating, you will see a JS. Uh, as part of their maker's mark. Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, all right. I got I to gotta talk about this just as uh, as we're going by this. But you mentioned hidden tang knives and you, you mentioned, uh, um, you know, changing it up. And here you've changed it up. You did a whole, uh, you did a series of K-bars, beautiful K-bars. Uh, describe that project and how it's, you know, the, the, some of the differences in making those knives. Um, yeah. And I had never made a K-bar. Um, and I had a couple of Marines, which is funny. I had two different U S Marines reach out to me and ask me to make a K bar <laughs> totally separate. And, um, so I figured if I'm going to make, I might as well make three. Um, and, um, so the K bar is an interesting, um, knife because it's so iconic. Everybody mm -hmm. like, not everybody, many people know about a K bar and what goes into it. Like, like I, I didn't realize when I did it that I would get such feedback from the military community about, you know, I want one. It has, and some of them were like, "You didn't get it. It's supposed to have a pin and and all this stuff." In the but, um it was my take on the K bar. Uh, but it was it was interesting. I'd never done a leather stacked handle before, so that was that was a challenge. Uh, I had never. That was the first knife I had ever done hot bluing of uh, of the fittings. So there was a bunch of new things in that blade. The blade itself is not that complicated to make. Um, it's the grind is relatively simple. It's not that hard of a of a blade, but the whole piece to get it right, the leather wrapped handle, or sorry, mm -hmm. the leather stacked handle is is actually more challenging than than I thought. <laughs> yeah, I I well, it 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 looks tremendously messy during the process. I would imagine, <laughs> yeah. uh, but but that's not what you're. Uh, uh, actually, Jim, could you bring that picture wide? Uh, we're we're looking at uh, one of Dennis Tyrell's custom um, K bars in a moment. And, uh, I wanted to talk about the guard. You, this guard is, is notably different than a standard K bar in that, like, this is a luxury guard. Uh, you know, the, the, the K bar has that stamped thing and, and I'm, I have a couple and they all kind of rattle just a little bit, um, or, or shift around. I, mine are a little bit older though. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. From that last as aspect, I thought the guard was more sculpted than it is. You did do a more of a traditional so guard here. What you saw on the last guard, it's actually made from the same material as the blade. So you're actually seeing a bit of the copper in the, um, oh, okay. that might be throwing you off. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Where that copper is on the tip of the top, um, yeah. you know, guard quillion makes it look like it's sculpted outward, but it's, I see. All right. Well, uh, if you can't if you can't uh, see what we're talking about right now because you're listening to this podcast, you have to check out Tyrell Knifeworks on Instagram and look at these uh, these K bars. I mean, so did you face uh, did you feel a lot of pressure working on an iconic knife design? Um, maybe not as much when I did it. I think I did more after I put the video out there and I started reading all the comments and like. I've been a Marine for 20 years and, you know, and 99% of the comments were very positive. I got a couple cool. that, Oh, the, the pommel is supposed to be pinned instead of screwed on. 
um, which honestly, I think that's a, a bit of a, I won't say a defect, but I think screwing the, the, the pommel yeah. on actually works better because then you can tighten it. But and, and I think only certain makers uh, did that pin thing through the through the pommel, uh, which seems like a weird way to make it. But whatever. What, who am I? Well, <laughs> like, I don't know. As soon as the leather shrinks, you would think it's going to there's no way for you to tighten it now as as, as, as opposed to twisting the handle on uh, the pommel on tighter. So that was my reasoning. Everything I do has a reason, I hope so. <laughs> Well, so, okay, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your brand and your background, um, and I want to find out kind of if you had any mentors and 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 a little bit more about your learning process. But uh, before we do, uh, the shark is a very prevalent symbol in everything. In, in you, you know, it is your symbol for your company. And I would I would venture to say that your handles are shark shaped. Your your knives are evocative of sharks. A, a lot of people's knives are, but I I find that your handles and the downward curve I don't know reminds me of maybe a gray reef shark doing that thing they do when they're threatened or um, I don't know. So, so they are shark like the the shapes of the blades. Tell me about your connection to sharks. So I'm also. Um... My other hobby is uh, scuba diving. I'm actually a, a, a paddy scuba diving instructor, and I have been for 20 years. So I've been in the water with many, many sharks, including great whites. Um, so that's it was a natural thing. I wanted to um, extend that into my knife making. So that's where all my knife models are named after sharks. I know he had a gentleman on not too long ago who also had... Um, uh, named his, his knives after sharks, but all of my models are named after different shark species. So like, that's like, where it came from. So what, what's it like being in the water with a great white shark? Well, I, I was in a cage, um, but uh, I, I was an instructor and I would be the person that would help the, the clients in and out of the cage. And uh, we would sit on top of the cage, uh, helping people in and out. And one time I got in the cage and um, we had a, a great white come up broadside in front of the cage. It was 17 feet long. Oh my God. <laughs> oh. It was very, I know that because the cage is only 12 and it was hanging off either side and it was six feet from me outside the cage. So when, exhilarating. When I, when I see those on, uh, you know, on shows on TV, I'm always struck by how chill they seem until they're not. <laughs> and, then it, and then it's all of a sudden this gigantic, huge, tooth muscly fish uh you know turns into bruce lee and is is making moves very quickly yeah i wouldn't uh, i would say i don't mind being in the cage and i don't mind even scuba diving to the bottom i wouldn't be swimming on the surface because oh, that's who, that's what they're that's what they're eating oh my god all right all right so sharks they it, it fits so do you find that your your two um hobbies swimming with sharks or, or diving with sharks and making knives do they how do they complement one another um i don't know that there's a lot of um kind of comparison there and people always ask me about oh well what knife would you take diving and stuff like that i mean i take the cheapest knife i can diving because i know they don't last long mm -hmm. <laughs> unless you spend thousands on a on a knife that uh you know but uh, I don't think there's a lot of comparison, but I, I use the whole shark motif and everything. So, right. Uh, maybe, maybe they put you in different head spaces. Um, what, what about mentorship? Okay. So I've seen a picture of you actually, it was recently on your Instagram page and, uh, and you were with uh, a couple of uh, knife makers I've heard of one of whom I, you know, I know of pretty well. How much of this input have you gotten? How much of, of your skills and knowledge have you gleaned from other people? Um, most of what I've learned has been YouTube. Like most of my mentors are other YouTube channels like, you know, Kyle Royer, Green Beetle, mm -hmm. um, the um, Outdoor 55, some of the Walter Sorrells. Most of what I've learned is through YouTube. It's only recently in the last three or four months where I've, I've really expanded my, um, actually maybe six months, whatever, um, expanded my involvement in the knife community. And it really is a lot of that is reaching out from the challenges we do on YouTube. And now taking my journeyman, the picture you saw was, um, was, I'm sure it's the one with Kelly Vermeer Vela and Michael Vagnino and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's where I was. That's the day I took my journeyman performance test. 
Oh, okay. So now you go in there, you have the knife red. Wait, so what is the performance test exactly? So you have to make a knife that has parameters, like it's like 15 inches total length, no blade no longer than 10 inches. Um, it's This test is all about heat treatment and all about mm. how you make the blade. And the first, there's a bunch of tests as part of this, but the first one is to cut a one inch piece of manila rope in one slice, free hanging, one slice, chop through a two by four twice. Then you need to shave your arm with it. And then you take that knife, put it in a vise, and you have to bend it 90 degrees mm. without it um, cracking, breaking. And if you can do all that, then you pass. <laughs> so that's that the, is that the English sword test? Is that what they call that? Where they, where they bend it? Kind of. And it's supposed to, does it return to true? No, it no. doesn't have to return to true. It's got to just not break. Okay. And what, what people don't, it's not just about the, the, the really um, ingenious part of that test. Cause I've seen people like, oh, well, why don't you just make it really thin, like a fillet knife? Well, then you're never going to get through the chop. Right. And, oh, what, why don't you just make a really like blunt edge? Well, then you're not going to get through the rope. So it's a well thought out test to, to make sure you know how to heat treat a knife and sharpen it and have the perfect edge geometry. And then be able to shave with it after you've done these other yeah. harsh tests. Yeah, that so that is that's pretty brilliant. So yeah. you must have been nervous as hell. <laughs> yeah, um, and I videoed the whole thing, and I put uh, you know you can watch that whole performance test. And people were saying it, I did it at Kelly Shop, and uh, people were saying like when the dog was barking, I didn't even hear a dog. <laughs> I was bending that knife. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> so it is you who who. Yeah, it's the 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 uh, candidate who does all the testing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the Michael just Michael Michael Vagnino is the master smith. He's just there to say, yeah, you went far enough. You're good. Wow. And and so you had an opportunity. I'm I'm presuming you tested your knife before this, right? Oh, yeah. you, you're allowed to do that, right? If, okay. In fact, they recommend you make three. Okay. And because um, you once you do the bend test, you obviously don't want to use that knife again. But right. all the others. Like I, even the knife that I tested, um, I had already done the rope and the two by four chop and resharpened it. And so I knew I was confident going in that I was not going to fail. So is it un, is, is that knife, your journeyman, uh, test knife is, is that a, uh, unetched Damascus blade or is that a different, uh, I mean, did all you go the, all out with, with everything or no, all the journeyman knives must be mono steel. Oh, Okay including this um this performance test knife that you're showing here uh it has to be mono steel uh for master all of the blades including this performance blade have to be damascus and and so why does it have to be mono steel for this for for the journeyman is it to make sure that you have other ducks in a row before you get fancy yeah and okay. it's it's just really about knowing how to heat treat that steel it's it's actually more important for the presentation knives because you can actually hide a lot of things in Damascus. Um, whereas oh. you've got a mono steel knife, you cannot hide bad hand sanding. Like there, you can't hide that kind of stuff. Right. Right. Oh my gosh. That was, uh, that was pretty amazing. So you, you were pulling down on, uh, if you're just listening, uh, we, we just saw some ransom video of his test, uh, where he was bending it, where, uh, Dennis Tyrell was bending his journeyman, uh, test knife in a vice with the with the aid of a five foot long pipe and man it, you were down on your knees pulling on that thing and it was at about 90 degrees for a good 10 seconds 15 seconds or something yeah it felt like it <laughs> wow wow so okay then when this knife passes makes it all the way through what do you do with that knife you have that knife there are you going to sell it are you going to keep it forever it, it has to go to blade um oh, and be okay. presented with your five knives but after that oh, as you mentioned you can yeah. do whatever you want i'm sure i will keep it um i do intend to get it master and if i have to instruct someone i want to be able to show this is how you do it this is what it looks like so will you be selling knives at blade as well or is this more of a a uh, I have a table at Blade this year. Uh, I will I will probably sell my five journeyman knives at Blade. They'll be for sale at Blade mm -hmm. after the, assuming I pass. Um, mm -hmm. So those will be up for sale. And whatever else I make before the show um, will be there as well. 
Okay, cool. Uh, I just want to make sure that I get a chance to see and heft your knives uh, while I'm there because I will be there. It's <laughs> I, last year was my first year, and man, it, what a what an awesome, great time that that is. There. Yeah, last year was my first time too. Oh, was, was it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was really cool. Just as a spectator. But... How do you design your knives? Uh, like, I know that you've uh, done this Bowie, and I know you you showed that recurve um tanto but like you said everything you do is a little bit new and a little bit different do they do they talk to you as you make them and and uh dictate to you what it's going to be like an author writing free form or I, I, i'm not one of those guys that can take a that not that i can't i don't like to take a piece of metal and just let it let the knife come out of it that, that's yeah. not me i will actually have I do all of my designs on, on knife print. It's a knife design software and uh, print it out. And I'm, I'm using that. So I'm a very, you know, I'm okay. an engineer at heart. So I, <laughs> I'm comparing to an actual design. So I do all my design work on the computer and then go down and forge to forge to the design. I wonder if that's evident. I mean, you're looking at your work. It's so, so clean. And I mean, it's very uh, refined in terms of design. I mean, we know it's refined in terms of fit and finish, but in terms of of design, there doesn't seem like there's anything there that doesn't need to be there, save for a couple of things. We're going to talk about that in a second, um, like flourishes. But um, I wonder if uh, one who does go to the forge and just let the steel speak to him, to him or her, I wonder if the the blades that come out of that look like they come out of that process you know what i mean like yours look like they come out of a painstaking design uh process because they're so clean and pure and i wonder if something that's a little more brute to forge is a guy like doing it the other way you know i wonder if you can tell from looking at the knife i i think it depends on the individual like some people are really good at the um just hammering it out and i think a lot of that comes with experience but i'm if I don't do a design beforehand, I'm terrible at handles. Like the handle will not be the right size. Oh. So that's one piece. Like I, I have to do a very conscious effort to make sure that like when I'm, when I'm designing on the computer, I can print it out five different times, 10 different times, hold it in my hand. I'll even go down to the shop, cut it out out of wood so I can hold it and know that, oh yeah, that handle is going to work. I don't, I don't like, I don't want to waste steel and I don't want to waste my time doing it on a forge and then screw it up and make the handle two inches too long or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, of course, there's that whole practical side of things I wasn't even considering too. So do you also, um, when you're designing, drawing it out, are you also looking at it in cross section and figuring out, uh, the, the, the width and the, you know, the geometry and everything like that? Uh, I usually, I usually know the, you know, I, I know how thick, um, like my blades are going to be, but if it's something a little more complicated, like a quillion dagger, something like that, then yeah, I'll, I'll draw out like the different, like if there's a guard, I will draw the top view of the guard and things like that. So that, yeah, I can paste that on the, on the fitting and grind to that, you know, that cutout, it gets that specific. Are you a good baker? Am I a good baker? <laughs> yeah. I mean, baking it, is too scientific. <laughs> see, to me, it's it. It sounds like you're very good at following. It's it's like a it's like a recipe you set out for yourself. And and I'm fascinated with this because I'm um uh I I'm creative in my personal life and I'm creative at work. And creative at work requires uh more of what you're talking about, laying everything out, fig prefiguring everything, you know, and and adapting as I go and problems arise. But having much more of a plan laid out. Whereas in my personal creative life, I'm much more of a, let's see what happens. And, and, and it does show, I think, uh, <laughs> in some of that work, but. I, I think one of the biggest things that, um, you know, if I can tell a new knife maker order of operations in knife making is one of the biggest challenges. And the thing, like, I, I literally like will lie in bed at night thinking about, man, what do I have to do on that knife? And I'll go through like all the steps and the order of operations is super important. Probably one of the most important things because if you if you get the order wrong and you accidentally, oh, I did the slot in the guard, but I didn't fully hand sand the blade, you're going to have a big gap in your guard. Like simple things like that. Because you're you, removing steel once you, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so I, I'm big on order of operations and making sure a, you know, 
and of course, when you're new, you race, oh, you want to race to getting, you know, etching it and you forget, oh crap, I forgot to drill the holes. So now the blade's already hard and, you know, you, you skip steps, but not skipping steps and thinking through all the things you need to do, that's, you know, I think that separates the, uh, the, the, the masters, like when you watch, I don't know, I'm sure you know who Kyle Royer is. You watch the, 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 the time he spends on every step, you know, he, he's one, he, he, I, I would say is probably one of my biggest inspirations as far as knife makers uh, and his style, very clean. That That's what I try to emulate the most. Yeah. That, uh, that order of operations thing is uh, boy, that translates kind of everywhere in life. Um, but I can see, and, and one can see, uh, with a knife immediately when, when that's been betrayed, like, like you mentioned, that's, that's pretty, that's something I wouldn't think of. The hand sanding does remove, you know, actual layers or, or, you know, it, it reduces the width of the blade and you're, and that's going to send everything tumbling and, uh, you may as well start from scratch at that point. Yeah. New guard at that point. <laughs> So I mentioned that that your designs are are very um, only what you need and and nothing else. And I, I don't mean that in an austere sense because they're not that they're not austere. They're they, they have a lot to them uh, in the in the textures, the Damascus and the handles, and then the overall profiles and everything. But you've got this copper thing, in you've got copper running in some of your Damascus, and it is wow, it's dazzling and it's totally unexpected and it's not something we see often. How did you come up with this and 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 how does it how do you do it um so this uh, and i don't remember where i saw it first i, I didn't invent it first of mm -hmm. all um okay. people have been doing it i know um baker forge and tool is uh has been doing it for a while uh, i think i'm one of the first to put it on youtube and teach people how to do it mm. um uh, i love it i i think it's very you know it pops it, it it's it's kind of what i'm you know my biggest videos are the copper damascus ones uh and really it's just copper as a melting point of like 1980 or something like that as long as you keep the steel below that temperature and not melt out the copper you can still forge the steel forge it to the, the way you want and then you can still heat treat it because you're never going to go over 1950 when you're heat treating and then you'll okay. keep a nice um, uh, copper. Obviously, you can't have the copper on the uh, on the cutting edge. And then I've gotten thousands of comments <laughs> about, <laughs> doesn't that make the blades hot? Like, no, it's there's a whole core of high carbon steel in the center, which is your entire cutting edge. And people get confused because they see the copper and they think it goes through the blade. Okay. Whereas it's just a sheet on the outside and then the grinding the bevel exposes that layer so some people get confused yeah well yeah i could see how you could you could think uh if it goes all the way through it's going to totally mess up the integrity of the blade but i mean um i think it's it's got to be i mean i didn't think that because it's got to be obvious if someone's making knives they've already considered that but yeah and i and i've what i've told people um the blade magazine uh 2021 blade of the year yeah had copper in it. <laughs> oh, well, my, one of the my, production knives had copper in it. So my thought was, this is not going all the way through, but could it come off if you were going to take one of those knives and pound it, pound it, you know, baton it through wood or something? Does it so, come off? I've done that kind of destructive test, and uh, if you, well, what I'm actually doing is not welding because it's not melting either metal, right? It's more like mm. brazing, and if you look up brazing you'll see that um, you Google brazing, copper brazing, and the brazing bond is about 70,000 PSI in tensile strength. So if you actually bend a blade, you, you're gonna snap the blade uh, before you'll shear the layers apart. And I've done it. Like the, the copper is very, very solid, um, solidly bonded to, to the steel. Wow, uh, those pictures that uh, Jim had up while you were talking about that were uh, man it, the the way the copper looks it's so um it looks like caramel kind of flowing through this chocolate blade uh it's beautiful Thank i you. I, uh, yeah, I i love it H have you had any um feedback from people see now this is the thing 
you're making these beautiful knives, but you also know that they are 100% stout and capable of taking incredible abuse. But you got to know most of them are not getting that abuse. No. <laughs> I'm sure you want them to because you want to know, oh, my knives are out there making yeah. a difference. But so have you ever had feedback about uh, the performance of your knives uh, besides looking amazing in, in a case? Um, not that, I mean, I haven't really, um, the copper ones, um, most people that use them are their display pieces. And yeah. so I don't, I don't had feedback on them and the copper. And I do warn people, you know, if you're going to use it for a bushcraft knife, you're going to be batoning it through wood. The copper is going to scratch. Okay. It's a soft metal. Mm -hmm. It'll mm -hmm. even wood will scratch it. Uh, so I warn people that, you know, that's not a good idea if you want to, to retain its beauty. But um, I've never had any negative comments or anything like that. And I've had a lot of positive comments on my other knives. Yeah, yeah. What are the, like, that's actually more what I'm going for. Uh, like, what, what are the kind of things people report back about using your knives? Um, and I have reviews on my website from, from people that have gotten my knives. The, um, the beauty, the, the, the cutting edge. I've had chef knives go out. And uh, so everyone's very happy with them. So that makes me happy. And I like to see them used. Yeah, they look. Uh, if you could hold your the the knife up again, they look so comfortable. E even even the uh, oh god, this thing is so cool. Excuse my. Uh, so if you're not yeah, seeing yeah. this, uh, Dennis is holding up this short sword he made. Uh, that is just stunning with a with a copper. I mean, it looks like a hamon kind of, uh, but this just beautiful line of copper through this long blade. What? Uh, so this was a custom order. Yeah, there was a commission. Um, the guy wanted an elvish style blade. And uh, we agreed that he said I had complete creative freedom, which is good. That's the way I like it. <laughs> and um, we agreed on a price. And uh, I'm pretty sure he got a good deal because I went way overboard on this one. Mm -hmm. um, I th This is the one I learned engraving on. So I did some engraving on the handle, on the fittings and stuff like that. But oh, nice. um, I love the way it turned out. So when do you have to ship it? So I'm taking that one to Blade, Texas to get some pictures taken. Oh, nice. So I told them it would be after Blade, Texas. Cool. Uh, so now when you make a knife uh, or or a sword in this case, do you make sheaths also or do you? Uh, OK, yeah. so how do, what's your sheathing process? Every um, every knife I make, except for kitchen knives, kitchen knives mm -hmm. come in a custom box. But every knife comes with a leather sheath. That one, the sword is actually going to be a, a custom scabbard, wood okay. scabbard with, for that for that sword. But uh, yeah, the, included in all the all my pricing is there's always a leather sheath normally for knives. So is that a, a skill that took you a long time? Also, I mean, is this a parallel skill that you built kind of at the same time, or did you have to play catch up? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I didn't know anything. I never touched leather. I started with Kydex a little bit, but mm -hmm. I, I felt like with the higher end knives, you really you need the the richness of leather. Yep. So uh, I figured I got to bite the bullet and learn how to do leather. And now all my sheets come with. I, I mean, I don't think I'm an expert at leather, but um, they look nice. Uh, I, I was gonna they're... say, oh boy, did you learn? Because I saw some sharp by Coop pictures. Uh, uh, some Jim Cooper pictures of one of your knives and it was rested on one of the sheaths. And I mean, it looks like, it looks like that's another thing, you know, that you're just, you got it down. Some, some makers don't even bother with the sheath at all and they send it out, you know, and you have to figure out your sheathing situation. I never thought that, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've never bought a knife way up in that, uh, in that end of knife buying where they wouldn't give you a sheath because it's, yeah. you know, so high end. That they don't, they're not even thinking about that or that maybe it's never even supposed to be in a sheath and it's supposed to rest on a, on a shelf, but Oh my gosh. I mean, your knives, I mean, look, that's that pouch sheath is beautiful, uh, but your knives in Kydex would be a crime because as much as I love Kydex, it does jack up a blade in the finish. And you know, a lot of what you're doing is about this refined finish. Yeah, and I think Kydex is more for like the tactical looking knives, which mine are not uh, yeah. typically. So it just doesn't, the, the design doesn't match. So it's got to be leather. Uh, so do you ever do any double edged knives? Uh, just curious. 
double edged as in like, uh, like I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm sorry. More like the Bowie that you have. You know how you've been making these uh the sub hilt uh fighter style knives mm -hmm. with the Bowie. Do you ever do the one with the uh, double edge on the back? Oh, you mean like a you mean like a false edge or an actual sharp edge? An actual sharp edge. Yeah, um I I don't I mean these are this is really close to sharp, but I don't typically make the um can get this in here i don't typically make this thing super sharp right but I, unless it's a dagger that's the only time i would typically make the double edge i don't typically sharpen them okay so that that's like a zero ground edge though or a swedge yeah. right uh, okay that's actually more what i'm talking about with the uh with the bowie knives with that zero ground swedge uh to me it becomes something more like a fighting knife because you can use it for that gouging uh yeah back okay so that that was just a uh yeah, a, yeah. A question for my personal edification when I start buying Tyrell Knifeworks knives. <laughs> Almost all of my the um the false edge, like the swooping false edge is kind of one of my signatures on all my designs. You'll typically mm -hmm. see the false edge on almost every one of my knives, including the uh this one, this this the 100k knife. It's more of a like a harpoon edge, I think they yeah. call it because it's flat, but I, you'll typically see those on most of my knives. So what inspired this uh, recurve Tanto? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I thought I wanted to do something different that was not uh, Bowie shaped. Mm -hmm. So um, again, wanted to do something different. Uh, wanted to, yeah, I don't do a lot of Tantos. I've done, I made a Wakazashi before. So that was kind of my only foray into that Tanto shape. Mm -hmm. So I figured, uh, you know, it was time to do it again. And then you did. You have that uh, pair up on your website of the double punch daggers, which is pretty cool. Was that uh, was that just a uh, just a bee in your bonnet to make something different? Uh, actually, I didn't even want to make those. I had a, a couple of guys at Blade West uh, ask me. They were fans and viewers of the channel, and they they came back to the table like two or three times and said please please make push daggers i said fine i'll make push daggers so that that's why i made them just for you weirdos <laughs> but no <laughs> i mean those those are really cool i i'm a i'm a sucker for a push dagger so how do you look to see how do you uh look into the future to see your knife brand grow and your youtube brand grow do you see them growing together do you see one outlasting the other I love, I really love doing stuff on YouTube. So that's, that will continue to be my focus. Mm -hmm. The only thing that might change is um, if I decide to retire from my day job then and go full time, because I, I honestly, I get people all the time ask me, can you remake that copper knife? Can you remake that whatever the knife is? Uh, and I just, I don't have the capacity to do that. I'm not a full time maker. And since I focus on YouTube, I can't, I don't have the time to also do a, a, a custom order on the side. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm right. busy on YouTube stuff. Right. So that's why I say, if you're going to want a custom order for me, it's got to be something different that I'll also make a video of. So that is the one thing that might change in the future. If I decide to go full time, then I'll, then I'll be taking on more orders and, you know, maybe have a line of production in air quotes, production knives that I'll do on a limited basis. So those would be knives that are more easily repeatable in the same sort of way um, using a simpler process. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't know about a simpler process because I, I I don't know that I'm ever going to get to the point where I'm laser cutting mm -hmm. um, not blanks and stuff like that. Um, I, I think I'll get bored of doing that really quick. So I don't want to get into the production knife. Uh, I'd rather be doing one of a kinds and just producing what I want to produce and sell them. That's more, more for me. Uh, so I'll probably end up doing that, but I do have my design. So I have like the thresher, which is my hunting knife. And I have the tiger, which is my Bowie knife. And I will do just variations on that, on those designs, different Damascus, different handles, different guards, that kind of thing. What is it do you think about working with hot metal and creating a knife that has kept you kept you in it you're a creative person that uses your hands you could be doing a lot of other things and documenting it on youtube what is it about metal and knives 
Um, I just like the creative aspect to it. There's, it's, it's one of those never ending, there's, there's no end of what you can make and there's no end of what you can learn, especially when it comes to Damascus and doing um, different Damascus patterns and, you know, there's that aspect to it. And of course, from when I was a kid, knives are just cool. Like guys like knives. So there's that aspect to it too. So it's the learning. It's the, you know, it's endless. Yeah. And it's interesting because you in particular, you know, half of your life is immersed in the most modern of tools. And then the other half of your life is immersed in the most ancient and original of tools. And there's got to be something to that. There's got to be something to that because that contrast, man, that's got to keep you grounded. And and it does. And it, and I've, I've said to many people, like, you know, once they get the big grinder and stuff like that, they're, I don't know how to grind this. I'm like, then use a file. Like, <laughs> don't, don't be afraid to get back to the old tools to do things. I mean, hey, I've got a mill. I've got a lathe. I've got some of the fancy tools. But there's a lot of times, like, when you see the swooping fa- false edge on uh, mm-hmm. on my Bowie knives, I do all those by hand with a file jig because mm. I just can't do them on the grinder and get them perfect where I can get them perfect with a file. So this is my point of like, I don't think I'll ever be at the production level because I spend so much time on little things because I want them perfect. Right. And, and to get them that way, you have to slow down. You have to slow down. You have to take your time sometimes with things. And it gets it it gets easier to do the older you get. I have noticed. Um, I, I keep trying to tell my my daughters that you know they're trying to rush through things. Just take your time. What advice could you give uh, someone who's uh, got an interest in making knives, but in forging knives as opposed to um, making uh, you know uh, stock reduction knives? Yeah, I mean just just get at it. I mean get yourself a you know a forge. Uh, an anvil or anvil shaped object, a hammer and just start. Uh, Cause you know, get into it and don't worry about what the first one is going to look like. Um, complete it. And that's the other thing. Don't, mm-hmm. don't create half created projects. Even, even if you know, the heat treats terrible, what finish it, put the handle on it. Cause you want to go through every one of those steps, then put it aside and work on the next one, make it better. And I've got, guys that uh friends that are just getting into it that i kind of mentor and take them through stuff and i tell them the same thing like okay yeah i know you don't like that one and you want to go to the next one but finish that one you're going to learn stuff on that one and i have a whole beginner series playlist on my channel exactly for this for how do i get started what tools do i buy um how do i do the most basic forging and uh and people love that series i get more views on you know that series than any of my other playlists well, tell people where they can go uh, on, on all your different uh, uh, channels to check you out. And then also how they can get in touch with you if they come up with that inspiring design that not only could they have possibly made by you custom, but also have the bragging rights of having a video made. Yeah. Um, uh, Tyrell Knifeworks uh, um, YouTube. So if you just go to YouTube and type Tyrell Knifeworks, you'll find me. And then my website is www.tyrellknifeworks.com. And my Instagram is the same, Tyrell Knifeworks. So I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Well, Dennis, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to talking to you a couple minutes uh, offline for the patrons. Um, I think your work is awesome. I love what you're doing with your channel. And um, the, the more people who, uh, who watch you, the better, because we, uh, we need some more excellent forgers out there. Thanks so much, Bob. It's, it's been really fun. Uh, it's my pleasure, sir. Take care. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Yeah, the one one thing that really resonates with me is how each build is just a little bit different because everything I ever do is, even when I try, or maybe even especially when I try and repeat myself, it's always a little bit different, and you got to embrace that. And I think think that's... uh, that is the way to go. Plus, when you see a, a, a layout of all of his knives, they're all gorgeous and they are all different. And that uh, 
Oh, who doesn't love that variety? All right, so be sure to check us out, uh, speaking of variety, uh, on Wednesdays for the Midweek Supplemental, where we go through new knives out there and in my collection. Also, Thursday Night Knives, our 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time live stream here on YouTube, also on Twitch and Facebook. And then check in back uh, next Sunday for another great interview with another awesome Knife World person. All right, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.